Hola. Para atrás. Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias. Okay. So, thank you. What we're going to talk about today, I'm going to tell you about a project that has to do with quality of service and performance. Services that reach the clients. The truth is that I imagine that most of you may have this problem of performance and quality of service and the infrastructure and the configuration of the machines in the periphery. But in this case, in this project, we faced it from the point of view of the peers that are directly talking to each other and control of uh, the congest uh, congestion and n n seeing it from the extremes, through the ends, to avoid jamming. So, the common control algorithms uh, to prevent uh, jammings, uh, I, I imagine that most of you uh, uh, don't uh, think of this, but actually it has a great impact and we are responsible for uh, one of these most important problems in the quality of service to clients. Y realmente no nos damos cuenta, no lo estamos tanto. And we really don't realize so much, so much. So the congestion control algorithms, most of them, that are installed by default in uh, the uh, OS have two key. Uh, uh, problems that we try to improve. The first is maximizing the throughput of the connections, and the second is minimizing losses. What traditionally used to be, well, reducing congestion, actually it was minimizing losses. And the technology of the algorithms or the criteria used for in those and the most common algorithms are based mostly on the detection of losses, uh, of leaks the criteria that they use to adjust uh, the transmission uh, algorithms have to do with the losses. So they may have a better or worse uh, logic for removing the losses before or after and how they treatment. Two typical examples are Cubic of Linux and some variations of Reno of Windows, but those are the most common that you may find, both clients and servers. And these are the causes of many of the problems. Now, what are these problems? How do we view these problems? This is the only slide that will expand on the details. But if we look at the first graph, what we can see here is the evolution of the data in flight that have many connections and share a bottleneck. And both Renault and Cubic very rapidly increase the number of in flight data and explore how many data can be stored by the network in flight until it exceeds the bottleneck and packets start to get lost. The first connection in violet very rapidly, very rapidly grows until it generates losses. You see the peak over here and then the other peak. So the connections that come later have a lot of disadvantage because the first is flooded by packets and the connections that come later don't have much space there and they have losses much earlier. So the first year 
keeps the majority of the capacity and all the other ones including the first one have a round trip time that is very high this latency time is much higher compared to the natural latency time that you'd have along the path between one end and the other normally the Ping times don't represent what the real connections really have. The times measured with ping sometimes find a flooded bottleneck, but the connections naturally flood and everything that goes there that will be shared with them will be delayed. So the other graph shows the development of the round trip time of all the connections that share that bottleneck. The first and all the others, let me check the pointer. So all these are way above the gray line, which would be the minimum they could achieve. But this is what typically occurs. So as I was saying, one way of dealing with this is AQM in the devices that generate bottlenecks such as these, which very often are in the provider's devices that then force the quality of service or the contract of the client. And that is where the majority of the bottlenecks occur. Now, what produces this increase of the latency? Normally, this is a long connection that doesn't suffer so much as it's the other connections that suffer from this. And this can occur not only with other users that are sharing with me, and it can also occur with the user's connections. The users normally have a lot of connections. It might occur that the, the user has a lot of connections. They are updating data or downloading a video and also downloading a website. And the website has many short transactions of request response and are much more affected by latency compared to the throughput. These are short transactions for short objects. A website might have 200 objects between graphs and all the rest. And nevertheless, these are very short request responses and all suffer from the round trip time produced by one of the others that got jammed in the bottleneck. Now, why do we continue using the traditional control algorithms that lead to such an accumulation of packets and produce the bottlenecks? Now, the truth is that the portion of the capacity is shared with those who share the bottleneck, which is the connection that will take have the largest share. The portion of the capacity of a connection is in proportion to the percentage of occupation in the outgoing queue of the bottleneck. So if we view this from the throughput standpoint, the individual connections have a little motivation to release that bottleneck and will prefer to flood this to jam it because if they do so they have a larger share of that capacity and they take it away from the rest so the truth is that while the criterion is only throughput it's like a relentless fight the one with the greatest flooding of the bottleneck will have the largest share now there are other objectives for the customer's quality, which is latency. Higher latency leads to um, greater rendering of the web page. And of course, it's not that this problem was not dealt with, but 
there are algorithms, traditional algorithms, that are sensitive to latency. The majority of these algorithms were classified in a category that's not very nice. It's called less than best effort congestion control, LBE. Now, as they do not flood this, if there is another connection that floods this, a larger share, it, it keeps a larger share. So these are algorithms that are called less than best effort. And there are options, for example, let bat uh, Apple uses one of these for the updates of the background of many applications. And the operations in the background don't care so much if it's less than best effort because the live applications that the users use and are interested in having uh, work, work fast are not as important compared to those that operate in the background. Now, considering the less than best effort, we view this with an adaptive behavioral standpoint. So, if we can decrease buffer bloating and if we share this with well-behaved behavior, we'll try not to jam the bottleneck and only take a smaller portion, but which is large enough to deal with the available capacity. But if we are sharing this with bad performing connections that flood, everything will go back to the traditional behavior and fight with the other connections, which would be the traditional way of dealing with this. One of the important things of an algorithm is what is a feedback based to see the conditions of the network. I think that the most innovative element or the one that is different regarding these bottleneck algorithms is a tool used to measure the status of the network. These tools is not only to study the congestion, but also to study the status of the network and the bottleneck remotely. So the tool we use for feedback purposes is a variable that the, we estimate indirectly and can be estimated both on the receiver side and on the sender side. In our case, we have two algorithms. I'm going to speak on the sender side, but we also have the receiver side. Now, this is a variable that measures the effect in the transmission rate produced by variations in the number of data in flight. This is a relative effect, so one varies in proportion the number of data in flight and how this affects the resulting rate. This variable, why is this so special? This is because we found that it is closely related to the portion of the connection in the total amount of the bottleneck. So this variable, when it is estimated, gives us a value that is 1 minus the percentage of the capacity that the connection has in the bottleneck. So we are basing the performance in the knowledge of that portion that corresponds to this connection of the bottleneck that it is sharing with others. What we see here is the curve. So when all the connections that share this did not take the available capacity, then this variable, when estimated, gives us one. And we know that if the available capacity has not been occupied, we need to increase the transmission rate and the number of data in flight. Now, when this starts to drop, it means that the connection is taking up a larger share of that bottleneck based on that we will then be making decisions of increasing or not the capacity on the sender side. 
why does this happen? We're using this to add to further objectives to the congestion control algorithm. One is maintaining the common objectives to minimize losses and to optimize throughput. And we added two further ones. One is to minimize latency, if this is at all possible, because this might not depend on us only, but also from the remaining connections. And secondly, that this is distributed fairly among those that arrive at this bottleneck. In addition to that, with an adaptive behavior, as far as possible, to avoid buffer bloat will have this behavior and when this is not possible we then come back to the traditional control initially this was done in a very uncommon way in other words instead of focusing in optimizing the outgoing traffic from the servers or from the machines we focused on optimizing the incoming traffic this is what we call the control on the receiver side so receiver side congestion control this was done in 2016 it was presented at the ETF and we're using this in the university proxies for the incoming traffic and this is compatible with sender so this is based we are limiting the increase of data and flight from the sender through the congestion window and measuring this variable on the receiver side and of course this is an adaption of the operating operation system this is done this has been done for linux now Thanks to Frida, we resumed this in order, we received funding from Frida in order to extend this and to produce a version for outgoing traffic from the servers that would be most have been done for outgoing traffic and implemented on the receiver, on the sender side. This is what we started to do in 2020 with the support of the Frida project. These are some of the details, and then I will be sharing you uh, the results with you. These are the criteria used for this algorithm. When the available capacity is not reached, in those cases, the algorithm grows, and once it is reached and it is sharing and it reaches, and meets the available capacity, this will depend. For example, if this just a small percentage of the overall capacity, then we continue to go in a regular way. But if we see that there is a portion of the capacity that is quite big, in that case, we limit the growth of the connection. We don't push all the other connections so that they don't add on to that bottleneck. We try to make this shared in a fair way. The only complicated issue is that we are estimating the bottleneck conditions, but we don't know exactly the number of connections that are sharing together with us. So that causes a bit of a uh, heuristic uh, a noise based on what you estimate, but that is an estimated part. This version for the out, uh, outbound uh, traffic, it's dynamic, but uh, for, for the inbound traffic, for the incoming traffic, it's a bit more complicated because we had to touch the stack, the core of Linux. But for the outgoing traffic, we generate it with dynamic load model, so it can be lifted in any uh, Linux uh, very easily, and it can be done for all the connections of the server, of the machine, or for individual connections if necessary. 
So that's what we did. We did it um, in uh, architecture x86, but it could you could use any, and with a Linux over 5.9. So at the lab, we did all the testing, but at this stage, we are very interested in inviting people to collaborate massively, to test massively in data centers and in massive uh, environments because uh, um, uh, in addition to con controlled uh, conditions, uh, um, well, that's okay, but if you control it uh, massively, it's, it's much better. You need a lot of time and you need the rich experience that is used and the feedback of how it's been used in uh, the Internet in general. We already mentioned this. Well, let me tell you a bit how it responds. Well, we t tested it intensively in the service of the university for outgoing traffic of web servers for short connections for all the transactions for many objects that there are normally in uh, webs and, and web pages hosted in service. The round trip times for short uh, uh, connections are similar in the algorithms as uh, uh, Kubik that are in the Palermo and the same for the throughput obtained for short connections. They are similar. However, when the connections start to extend to be longer, The latency and the round trip time of Kubik uh, starts to be uh, much longer. So they flood and they cause this problem with round trip times that are much longer than uh, the round trip times uh, measured with ping. They are really much longer. Whereas, whereas the round trip time obtained when congestion Palermo is activated in the service is much lower, 50 or 55 percent lower than when uh, COVID is being used. And as to the throughput, let me uh, mention that in the service, in the, when the Palermo algorithm is activated, the throughput may be 30% less for long connections. Why is it a bit um, sm smaller? Because in the op equation to be optimized, I'm not optimizing the throughput only, but also latency and the fair distribution of capacity. So the capacity is going to be a bit smaller for each of the connections, but on the other hand, it improves the distribution of capacity. So the rest, uh, it doesn't flood the rest of the connections and it improves a lot. So there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off here. And it is that <coughs> activating the uh, Palermo congestion uh, algorithm um, um, uh, alleviates the problems. I think that the latency problem may sometimes be a bit serious for some transactional services, and they improve a lot. <coughs> In this case, <coughs> they improve by 55% the latency. And the trade-off is that it worsens 30% uh, of the throughput. So we believe that that trade-off uh, is worth it. So this is what I was just saying. Well, the long in long term. Uh, transmissions 20% uh, less the throughput uh, and uh, instead of a 50% increase in time.
So, as a conclusion, we invite we invite you to test in large volumes in data centers. Uh, we'd like you to test this uh, algorithm. We offer ourselves to help you handle it because we find it a valid solution to improve. Uh, it's a valid option to improve the performance of outgoing traffic of service. And it's va it's a valid alternative. It's better than working on the infrastructure, routing infrastructure and uh, the smart queues. And so it's, it's better to, uh, these are strategies these are alternatives to attack uh, the problem there are several that are valid this i think this is good a good one at present we are studying the issues that have to do with the robustness of the algorithm because under different conditions and different behaviors they all require a lot of testing but it's it's performing quite well we've even compared it against other options that seek the same algorithms as the BBR. BBR is a congestion algorithm that is used by Google for Quick. It was extracted from Quick and put in TCP. So our algorithm of congestion Palermo is compatible with uh, are quick and with BBR in the sense that they can coexist in a bottleneck and they get similar performances and they distribute things similar. That is, they have similar objectives, they follow similar paths. We're also going trying to uh, distribute it in a standard manner so you won't have to install it manually by the administrators. That's the other thing. So finally, I wanted to thank Frida. Their help was very important. It enabled me to work at this. Uh, um, and uh, so the, our teams could work well. And if there are any questions, please, uh, uh, I'd be very happy. Yes, we have time for one question in the room. There are no questions online. There are no questions in the room, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Alejandro. All right, thank you, Alejandro. I also want to thank